Um, right, OK, on today's programme, James Lavelle, founder of the Mowax label, and uh, sort of made, well, the... Um, the Grand Supreme Master of Uncle. We'll be talking to us uh, after 2.30 about the new documentary film, The Man from Mowax, which charts his career, which is an, an interesting piece of work, actually. I mean, um, he, there's a lot of people, a lot of criticism of him in it, and uh, sort of a lot of, you know, kind of people with a bit of an axe to grind. And presumably James has been, you know, given us his blessing and uh, been part of the making of it, so it's quite interesting, uh, the portrait of himself that he's allowed the film to paint. Um, not that it's a negative portrait, but, you know, you can't say that, uh, you know, it's just kind of emphasising all his good points. It does do that, but uh, there are some uh, reservations expressed as well. So talking to James at half past two. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from Chain going Chain suggestions, under. please, following on from King's Cross by the Pet Shop Boys. Uh, that is the message, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. And um, uh, the film, uh, The Man from Mowax, is, uh, featuring James Lavelle. Star- Do we say, can we say starring James, do you think? Uh, Are you I... <laughs> starring in your film? But <laughs> kind of, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, main the, protagonist, yes. For you, a scrawny, specky kid from Oxford. I mean, uh, the the message. That's kind of where a lot of it begins, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hearing hip hop when it first sort of started. From um, I think I, I think I'd heard the message actually, maybe on top of the pops actually. Right. And then there was um, these compilations that came out when I was um, younger called Street Sounds, where basically all these rec- records from america which were 12 inch releases which you couldn't buy anywhere were put into these really amazing compilations yeah and that was the kind of beginning of buying records really for me i mean actually it was like buying cassettes right or stealing them right. <laughs> yeah. i mean you say you know it's quite interesting the early parts of uh, the early parts of the film obviously you, you're sort of struggling a bit your, your, your father's left the family home and leaves you bereft and sort of rootless you're, and your mum says you're an unusual child and you know an educational psychologist was involved incidentally what is your mum wearing it looks like she's got a t-shirt with human hair on it uh, you know what i don't know who knows you know some some new age you know um spiritual uh zeitgeist t-shirt I'm sure. but you were definitely looking for something and sort of the, that record and the record that was the portal to this new world wasn't it really yeah i mean i i was pretty obsessive when i was when i was i still am i suppose but when i i was very into martial arts when i was before music and yeah. martial arts kind of intertwined with with music in many ways, particularly black music and hip hop and soul and funk. And that was kind of my first real experience of, I suppose, finding a kind of something that felt quite tribal when I was doing that mm. and, and escaping the, um, the atmosphere that was going on at the time and, and, and just looking for something, trying to find yourself as a kid because, you know, in those days it wasn't like it is now. And, you know, you, in the sense that, you know, we, we weren't in an internet world and things you kind of you know it was all about discovery and going yeah. places to kind of find things and so the video store martial arts and through martial arts kind of and and also my 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 father was uh, a musician and and uh, a brilliant jazz musician and folk musician and um my grandmother was a a, a, a classical musician and teacher so there was always music was very very heavy in my you know around me in my upbringing and uh <laughs> And I discovered hip hop, and that was that was kind of it, really. You know? You're DJing from a very young age, like 14. I mean, you kind of fund your uh, DJing. Your mum gives you a, a year's pocket money up front. Yeah, I managed somehow <laughs> to persuade my mum to lend me uh, a year's pocket money to go and drive me to uh, Rainer's Lane. I remember <laughs> uh, to go and buy uh, two turntables and a mixer. Yeah, right. And that, yeah. and and I basically said so if she. Let me do that. I was going to put on a party, and if I made the money back, I'd pay her back, and I did. Well, that's which great. Which is pretty, yeah. pretty yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. But I actually kind of became a DJ. I started uh, probably around sort of 12, where it was all, it was very much sort of the whole breakdancing thing was going on, and we'd go and, we, you know, there was a crew of us, and we'd go around Oxford, and it was sort of busking, really. You'd have, like, your lido, lino, and, you know, I used to carry the t- play the tapes because I was terrible at breakdancing. <laughs> and it kind of started from there, and then I remember there was a, 
like a school party and it was kind of like who's going to be the DJ oh James will be the DJ and right. it sort of was that sort of became the catalyst and and just then getting really into buying records I was going to London I grew up in Oxford and I was going yeah. to London to do martial arts and, and into Soho and at that time Soho was just full of these amazing record stores you know and culturally it was just it was it was just this amazing kind of it was like science fiction really coming from from Oxford and seeing the people there and these incredible records and the energy and they were, they were these kind of massive social hubs you know? so was it inevitable that you would form Moax you would form a label because you know obviously playing these records discovering these records playing them to people in clubs that's one thing but uh, you, you know clearly you you knew there was all this great music out there and you, and you wanted to put it out to so, so globally really well, it was weird because I, all I really wanted was a record uh, was a job in a record company right I did some I did a bit of intern at um, Island Records and Talking Loud, Giles Peterson's label, and uh, I couldn't get a job. And I started DJing more and more in London, and I, I, I got this uh, job writing a column in Straight No Chaser, which was this amazing kind of eclectic magazine, which was sort of very sort of the, the world of Giles Peterson, I suppose is the best way to describe it. And I got this opportunity to start this column, which I called Moax Please, where I... I persuaded them to let me write about new new records, and through that, people started sending me so many demos, and I I, I just decided to start a record label. I, I think originally I couldn't get a job, and then it kind of it was sort of kind of what was happening with DJing. You know, people started start, starting their own labels and releasing records, and a lot of the, a lot of the artists that I'm working with were my age, and the re major record labels weren't interested in what mm. those kind of artists were doing. You know. I mean, I remember when I when I when I started working with DJ Shadow, you know, and and people would tell me that instrumental music would never sell. I always thought, well, that's kind of strange considering Beethoven and Brahms and <laughs> yes. Pink Floyd to a degree. But anyway, yeah. there you go. So, yeah. Well, that's a turning point and a, and a key relationship. You and DJ Shadow. We'll play the number song by DJ Shadow, and uh, and then we'll talk more because one of the kind of recurrent themes of the film is key relationships and how they fracture, isn't it? Really. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Okay, so here's DJ Shadow, and then we'll talk more to James Lavelle. One, two, three, four, five. Break down, baby. Uh, DJ Shadow and the numbers song uh, on uh, Moax. We're talking to uh, James Lavelle, the man from Moax, which is a film that's in uh, selected cinemas around the country on the 30th of August. Uh, same day, James is doing a Q&A at uh, the South Bank. Um, uh, so, DJ Shadow, in the film, uh, James, it, it's sort of said that you're the head of Moax and he's the heart. Or was it the other way around? Um, I think <laughs> it was the was it the brain or the heart? Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so um, it was it was I a was key the relationship. Heart, he was the brain, I right? Think. Okay, or maybe right. the other way around. I can't. <laughs> remember. <laughs> but it was the key relationship at the centre yeah. of it all for a long time, wasn't it? I think. Well, it, it, it was part of it. I mean, there was so there were a lot of other people involved that yeah. were also as important. I think that in a public, in the sense of somebody who was the most successful artist on my wax, yeah. um, DJ Shadow, and introducing, I think, being probably. The, in 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 the in the history of of what I've done musically of releasing records has probably had the most impact I think in that respect. Yeah. But I mean, the you know the documentary has its sort of agenda and it, it focuses on certain people, but there were a lot of other people that were very key. To label. I mean, Charlie, who's in it a lot, was very important. Um, mm. And it, in many ways, it was the thing with Moax is the height of Moax. It was like a band, really. It was a collective. It was this you know group of people from you know whether it was people making music or artwork or djing whatever coming together and and it was that gr that whole group of people that really made it what it was i think than one rather than one individual well so there you go in, in a way you touch on the strength and the weakness because working with a band working with friends is great until it's not. And, yeah. and you know, the, the, the label get you know, a lot of money comes in from A&M to take it to the next level. Yeah. You decide that, you know, rather than just being, you want to be the artist, in a sense, uh, as uncle. And, and, you know, a lot of people start to resent that it's changed and they don't have the access to you that they did. And if you're the artist and it's your label, are other acts going to get the attention they deserve? It throws up a lot of issues, doesn't it? It does, but I mean, I, I, I actually put out records from the beginning. The label, I started the label so I could put out my own music. I mm. think that at that time, 
things like that were very uh, were, it was it was very unusual i don't think it is now mm. so much but i do think yeah it c can cause issues um i think that with that record it just became it kind of it became the sort of end of an era and and it you know with you've got to understand that you're going from being i was very very young i mean science fiction came out i was 24 mm. i started the label but when i was 18 and it kind of finished by the time i was 28 mm. um and you know like in the sense of you looking at it like a band because it was a collective in certain ways it is a bit like many stories of many bands that have these incredible incredible members that do this incredible amount of work and it kind of implodes um but i think that yeah maybe you know science fiction sort of became a kind of a beast really in in, in certain respects i i think maybe if, if it hadn't been me and shadow and maybe if it'd been a record that me and tim had made where tim was the original member of 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 um uncle who yeah. went on to do dfa with james murphy i think it would have probably been quite different i think there was so much there was so much pressure from the record company to this thing to to become this huge thing and it kind of spiraled out of control and the effects of that on me personally and, and on the label became, became quite heavy i mean i then went on to do moax with um with beggar's banquet and xl and unfortunately I think that you know the sort of the, it was like the band had sort of split by that point, if you know what I mean. Right. And it didn't. And also because of the success of the label, um, for a very you know a short period of time, everybody else wants to be to have a part of that. So, um, like so many things that happen, you know, once all the other majors start coming in and you know the deals start getting crazy and you know da da da, it sort of it kind of. It, it imploded really <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting i mean your role in it as a kind of you know as as you said your dad was a musician and your, and your grandmother and everything i mean you're not and uh, you know your role is kind of uh, you know having the ideas getting the right people together for it it was said in the film some artists use paintbrushes james uses people that's a very stark way of putting it but you've allowed the film to paint this portrait of you which is not always entirely positive um yeah, Presumably I mean, you had approval of what was I, in it. I, yeah, I did. And I mm. think, you know, I think there was a sort of decision, or, you know, I sort of made a decision to everything you see these days is so sort of manufactured. Mm. And, you know, and I, I, I'm more interested in watching a film like Hearts of Darkness than I am watching <laughs> a film about how great somebody is yeah. constantly. Um, I, I think that it has an agenda. I didn't make the film, and I think that it, the, there's a lot of stuff that's not in there that's missed out because I think you know it fi it follows a certain kind of um, traditional format of the kind of the high than the low than the high. and you know there's a sort of uh, way that it it it, it, t it takes you on that journey, which is sort of very a, a kind of quite a cinema way of doing things. I think that. You know, it, does it define the whole of Moax? Absolutely not. You know, there's a lot of people that weren't in there. But I think it shows you, I mean, for me, I, 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 I kind of sit back now. I, had, I, I found it quite difficult for a while to deal with, with it and look at it. But I think now, in the last couple of years, when you look at, especially with, what's, what, with people going through the issues they are and being much more public and much more discussed, i.e. mental health, addiction, da-da-da-da-da, mm. and, you know, it kind of really hit me when Avicii, um, what, with, with what happened to Avicii, yeah. I kind of sat there and I went, you know what, man, I, I, I went through all that without... You know, so without even being in the world we are now where people you could talk about it or understand it, it was very, you know, it was like being in a, the sort of classic Hunter S. Thompson quote when I was in the record industry. And it was very male. It was very bullying. It was very street. It was it was also incredibly fun and, and exciting and and um, hedonistic. And mm. it was the last era of the lunatics running the asylum. Mm. But with that, you know, it, 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 for me, I, I kind of, I, I, there was a lot of cliches, and I was you know, very young, you know, and um, and I think that I sort of look back now and I go, wow, well, I survived. Indeed, <laughs> no. yeah, indeed. And your role in it, I thought, was summed up very neatly by say, someone in the film. I, again, I can't, I, I scribble these things down and forget to assign the quotes, but someone said, you know, about your role as a kind of music maker at the centre of Uncle, you know, when people say, well, he's not playing anything, he's not singing, uh, you know, but it says, uh, should the architect uh, have to put the bricks on top of each other. 
which I thought was a very neat way of putting well, it. Well, I think, I think I've always had that argument, but, and I don't think that, you know, I think if you want to go back to a lot of records, and brilliant records, especially in electronic music, it's, it, a lot of it's about ideas and yeah. people collaborating on ideas. Yeah. Um, I think that when I made science fiction, it was a period of time where it was still a very rock and roll, live, you know, let's say, for example, you know, Noel Gallagher writes Wonderwall on a guitar. That's being in a band. Being you know uncle or you know a massive attack or bjork not bjork or, or goldie or you know these chemical brothers or whatever yeah that's a different way of making music yeah you know indeed but indeed. ironically enough it's kind of the way that 99 percent of music is made <laughs> sure. right now sure and the idea of creating a universe around you where it's not just about music um which i'd always seen through other bands and 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 and, and scenes you know, before me, but I think now is pretty much part of, of populist music culture. You know? But you do get a bit, so you, there's a very t interesting one. We're going to finish off and play Be There, um, Uncle featuring Ian Brown. And and there is a sort of one moment in the film where you're on top of the pops and uh, Ian Brown's singing and, uh, you know, you're sort of coerced into playing a few notes on a Mellotron and you say, that was very degrading for me. Well, it wasn't that. It was, it was degrading in the sense that me and Chad were meant to be both DJing. Yeah. We were both meant to be. And I just uh, I did a massive tour with the Scratch Perverts. I mean, you know, a, a musician in the sense, I, I do play. I do play on my records. I sing on my records. I play piano. I learn to play cello. But I'm not somebody that goes out and plays guitar on stage in mm. a traditional way. Um, that was it, was... it was degrading because... Shadow had walked out, had left Uncle by that point, and then decided to come back for Top of the Pops. Right. Even though when I did Be There, Shadow wasn't in the studio, and he, he had nothing to do with Be There. Right. I did that with Ian, all the Mellotron parts. I played the Mellotron parts on mm. that track. And so it was kind of like, it was, more, it was more degrading in the relationship that I had with Shadow and, right. and the way that his ego had sort of, uh, where his ego had gone at that point. Do you like yourself after watching the film? Do you think it's fair? Um, I think it is... Do I think it's fair? Um, at times. At times <laughs> it has its agenda. Um, do I like myself? I, 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 there's, there are moments in it that I'm very, 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 very proud. There are moments of it that I, you know, it's, it's actually cathartic. You look at yourself and go, well, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> it kind of puts a, you know, and it, it also you've got to remember this, this film f concludes four years ago when I did Meltdown. So a lot has yeah. gone on and changed since then. Sure. Um, I feel that it, it puts a full stop on, on a certain period of life. And I think in the end of the day, I just try to do, I really just try to push the bar and do, uh, you know, make as, the best music I could. And I think in that sense, I am proud of myself for doing that, you know, and working with the people I did, you know. Indeed. Uh, the man from Mowax.com for all the details. Uh, 30th of August, if you want to see it in selected cinemas, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, play that. Uh, thinking of you skulking under your hood doing be there on Thanks top of the that. pops. Thanks yeah. for reminding me about that. <laughs> that, that classic moment. <laughs> uh, great talking, James. Thanks My a lot. My pleasure. Take Thanks, care. Bye. Cheers, bye. bye.